Imagine this, you're at the bottom of a large river. Perhaps it's the Fraser. Something large starts to move towards you. You think you might recognize it. I'm gonna give you a couple hints. It's the largest freshwater fish in North America. It's part of an ancient lineage that's been around since the time of the dinosaurs. It looks like the photo in the middle of my slide. It's a white sturgeon. Hi, I'm Jen and I study white sturgeon early life history. Why? Because unfortunately this wonderful species is listed as endangered in many of its populations across its range in Western North America. Overfishing for caviar was a historic issue for white sturgeon, but the primary threat is what is known as recruitment failure. This broadly refers to a lack of survival of juveniles to sexual maturity. White sturgeon spawn successfully every year, but in most populations, none of their embryos survive past the first month of life. Recruitment failure has been linked to dam construction on many rivers. Dams alter water flow, which changes the way that sediments are deposited throughout a riverbed, which changes the nature of the riverbed itself. In rivers such as the Nechaco, the riverbed has been filled in with finer sediments such as sand, which is an issue because previous studies have shown that sand is not a suitable habitat for white sturgeon larvae. There's also nowhere to hide from a predator in the sand. Predatory stoneflies that you can see in this image if you look closely are large invertebrate predators that will consume just about anything and live in the same environment as white sturgeon larvae. However, no one has ever observed whether they consume these early life stages, although previous studies with lake sturgeon have indicated predation by stoneflies. I set out to investigate whether these invertebrate predators consumed white sturgeon larvae and whether this level of predation varied based on the substrate size. Contrary to my predictions, I found that there wasn't a higher predation rate in the sand treatment versus larva, larger substrate treatments, but that the stonefly larvae did seem to be consuming the white sturgeon larvae. Larvae in the sand treatment were smaller and had lower condition factor, which is inferred to mean lower health than the larvae that were in the largest substrate treatment, which I've shown on the right. This means that this larger substrate with refuge habitat appears useful for larval growth, but not for protecting from this invertebrate predator. So in the bigger picture, my research is part of a larger effort to understand the pressures faced by the early life stages of white sturgeon so that we can inform conservation managers about substrate restoration in white sturgeon spawning grounds. The hope is that we can create an environment where these wonderful fishes can reproduce successfully once again. Thank you. Hello everyone. Evolution is in everywhere. When I was a child, I wanted to become a civil engineer. I, want, I looked a lot of movies, people always with a full, of, a full of drawings in their hands. I learned that too. And when I was in a teenager, people turned into a 2D model in a computer and I learned that too. But afterwards, I went to, a, went to a college, people said 3D model is a trending right now and I learned that too. But right now in the industry, BIM is a current trend. BIM means building information modeling, which is a one platform where, we, where you can uh, combine analyses, all the 3D elements and the uh, estimations and the simulation all together. And it is going to save a lot of time. But you know what? In the industry, it is also started to getting old. So what will be the next stage? So, even, even in the BIM, modeling is a difficult part, right? So imagine you don't need to model anything. You have a scanner in, in, in front of you and it will automatically scan everything and automatically put that model into a BIM. So this is, this is what we call VDC, that means Virtual Design in Construction. I am planning to use this, construct, this uh, technology into my research to combine the performance in structural and sustainable, uh, uh, to develop a relationship between that and to find a perfect timber model and develop a framework. 
So my research based on four phases. First is collecting data, and second is optimizing uh, a framework uh, by using some kind of softwares for structural and sustainability. And for the third is assessing those details. And for the final one, uh, we are planning to develop a robust framework uh, and planning to use that into a government, Canadian government. Here we can use that into for the future timber building and it will reduce environmental carbon footprint. And this is my research. Thank you. Today, I would like you to imagine a forest that swapped its live trees for burnt, charred stumps and ashes. Now, if you're thinking of an area the size of a cut block, I need you to think bigger. Imagine instead you're staring at an ocean of stumps and ashes that span off, far off into the distance. When you look at this forest in this vast expanse, can you see where there are trees? Or as the slide suggests, there might be phoenix that are failing to rise from the ashes? Can you see aspen trees suffocating out baby pine trees or saplings withering in our hotter climate? When the task at hand is to find where these trees are failing to thrive, traditional methods have you traipse far off into the distance and clamber over hundreds of thousands of burnt, charred logs. And these areas can cover environments larger than entire provinces, like Prince Edward Island. When you're out in these areas, it can feel like you're trying to find a needle in a haystack. And the problem becomes that once you get there, it might be too late for these trees or these phoenix that are failing to survive. The need to find new ways to monitor this forest recovering after a wildfire event is apparent. We know that wildfires are increasing globally and BC is no exception. Measures made remotely offer one solution for us to stay away from the field and safe while also completing this task of finding where trees are failing to thrive. One of the most well-known remote sensing based methods to do so is Lance, uses Landsat satellites. Landsat satellites have been in orbit for over 50 years and offer a legendary data set for us to compare the colors or the spectra that we see on the landscape to different structures. Now previously, assessing this connection between structures and the colors that are measured from Landsat was impossible. To do so, you need continuous measures over large areas that can be compared to Landsat's 25 by 25 meter pixel. Now, new technologies like remotely piloted aircraft can capture this forest structure at centimeter resolutions over hectares and hectares, flying over this gap that we've previously had. In my research, I can connect these continuous measurements of forest structure to the colors that might be seen by a Landsat satellite. And when I do so, you can clearly see where there's areas on the landscape where trees have regrown and areas where there are trees that have not regrown. So now, when I look out across the landscape, I can better understand and know where there's trees failing to thrive or phoenix failing to grow without ever having to visit the site. Thank you so much. Okay, good. Plant a tree and help with climate change. Have you heard that before? Probably, because there is a big group of countries that have already pledged half a billion hectares of tree planting across the globe. Half a billion hectares is a big number. And it leaves no, no option for us but to plant those trees in areas that are rural communities where people use the land for other things, for example, for farming. And if we don't have a very good business case and reasons, that tree planting is not going to happen because people need that land. My research looks at two different examples of uh, tree planting efforts that are typical uh, across the globe. Public policies uh, tend to plant trees very quickly with a lot of money, but then it's very hard to know what's going to happen with those trees once the money is gone. Grassroots organizations, like the one on my left, uh, tend to plant trees very carefully, but it's very hard for them to reach scale. The public policy of Sembrando Vida is giving money 
and uh, advice to half a million families across Mexico to plant one million hectares of trees. That's a very, a very big policy, but also when we looked at the, at the distribution of participation across the country, what we find is that the money ends up going to areas that already have trees. And we're also, a lot of trees are lost, but it might, where it might be a better idea to retain the trees that already exist more than planting new trees. To my left, a grassroots initiative in the south of Mexico uh, started their, their own project of tree planting and they did it on their own. Government came to support, but they started it and designed the initiative. That project has worked very well, but it has taken them 30 years to reach just a regional scale. My research is trying to understand how can we inform policies in order to make more efficient, more successful, and more timely decisions in order to plant trees in this coming United Nations decade of ecosystem restoration. Thank you very much. Uh, hi, I believe everyone sitting in this room holds a couple of devices such as computers, cell phones and others. And how often will you replace them? And when you are feel excited about your brand new product, have you considered one question? Where will this dispose the products go? Yes, they will become electronic waste. As reported by the United Nations, almost 15 million tons of electronic waste will be generated annually, which is equivalent to throwing away 800 computers per second. This electronic waste has badly contaminated our environment, including our soil and our uh, water. Indeed, Electronic companies had did a very good job to make their customers happy and satisfied based on their so-called human-centered design principle. But they never give any cares on the disposal issues. As, um, as, as, um, as, said, by, as said by the, uh, uh, by the officer from the Silicon Valley Talks Committee, the results of a high-tech revolution will become the pure poison to our environment if we couldn't dispose it in a proper way. So therefore, it's time for us to transit from the human-centered design to the nature-centered design. So, but what we can do like, to contribute to this transition process? Like, as a student from like, the uh, wood science, wood has been the most powerful weapon for us, but how can we link to like, the ancient traditional wood materials to the, like, the modern and the electronic devices? And this is also become the question that drive my PhD research. During like, over the past four years, I many folks have used the serious nanofibro, a strong nanomaterial extracted from the, from the wood to make a variety of electronics, such as artificial skin, string sensors, stretchable cable for signal transmission, and even for the information encryption devices. So out of these material systems, I have verified the multiple benefits of serious nanofibrils. In addition to make these devices very, uh, like, uh, more eco-friendly, it can also in enhance the key properties of these devices, including the mechanical properties, conductivity, and even environmental stabilities. And all of these new findings have been like really reported by another nanomaterials. So in the future, I hope my PhD research can serve as a guide for the fabrication of next generation biodegradable electronics. But more importantly, can help us like to help, uh, to help like the bio-based polymers to find a new applications. Thank you. Yes. Hello, everyone. Have you been for a forest walk any time? Did you observe any pine trees around you? Today, we are going to uh, discuss about the lodgepole pine. Lodgepole pine grows predominantly in Canada and Western North, Northern America. So it has some incredible properties of thriving in the mining sites and fire affected areas. So how we can use these, uh, like how these lodgepole pine trees are thriving in the uh, affected areas. 
scientists have been taking samples from the soil and they noticed the pine trees sustain in the nutrient poor soils whereas the pine tissues has equal has good amounts of nitrogen but where does this nitrogen come from then they realized some sort of endophytic bacteria living inside the plant tissues is helping the pine to thrive in those environments by fixing atmospheric nitrogen not only fixing nitrogen but it also helps the tree by producing plant growth hormones and also inhibits the pathogen inside the pine trees so today my research is about how these strains i'm going to take the strains and combine them in various ratios and inoculate in the pine seeds to evaluate the nitrogen fixation content and also how it promotes the length and biomass of the pine this research can be helpful in the field as well as these endophytic bacteria which has these capabilities can be used as a bio inoculant to reclaim the soil in the sustainable forestry thank you here we go uh, have you ever seen a wasp on the wood so as a student staying in forestry faculty for over 6 years i always see these little creatures staying on the wood but the wood is actually not their food. So they chew the wood with their mouths and cut them into pieces to build their own house, which you may see in the wild. From outside, it looks like a rugby. However, when you look inside, you will find out it actually combines the thousands of the honeycomb structures inside. So I'm always thinking whether we can mimic a wasp in the lab. Um, I started to think like a wasp and notice that actually we can do an even better job. So uh, because we can actually uh, separate the fibers from the tree and we can break them into microfibers and then in the end, even nanofibers. So when a material reaches the nano material, uh, nanoscales, there is a terminology called nanoscale effects, which means our material will have a unique properties, which is much more stronger than the normal materials. And uh, as a wasp in the lab, we already have the material, now we're going to build our nest. So 3D printing techniques is the first technique come to our mind because it just likes the process of the building uh, of the nest and also the nanomaterials we used is also quite suitable for the nest buildings. So after construction, as you may see, our built honeycomb structures is pretty, uh, pretty light and it can stand on top of a dent line. And, uh, but however, in the meantime, it can hold the weight of a 6.8 kilogram uh, on top of it without crash. Also, with this kind of techniques, we can also build elastomer property, uh, properties materials, such as this octopus. It's a rubbery octopus can be uh, stretched to 10 times of its own length. And also the foam materials we use to mimic uh, a human, human ear shape. So as a wasp in the lab, uh, hopefully someday, at least someday, I can build a nest for all of us to live in with those different new materials we made and obtained and learned from nature. Thank you. So here are 56 ecosystems zones on the map. If you, if you have no problem counting, you can try counting them. So by the end of the century, do you think they'll still be there? The climate is changing and it's becoming more and more chaotic. And ecosystems are facing unpredictable um, climate and they might, have, they might face dry and hot climate in the future. So I am building a machine learning model to predict the suitable habitats for ecosystems in the future. The model takes in the existing ecosystem classifications from the normal period of 1961 to 1990, and then it takes in the ecological factors of that time. And after, after the association of the factors and the existing um, classification is built, I input the predicted ecological conditions for the future, and then generate the projection of suitable habitats in the future. 
However, the future is pretty unpredictable. Just like in the famous poem, The Road Not Taken, the decisions we make today will impact our future a lot. So that's why I take the shared socioeconomic pathways in my model. The pathways are modeled based on different assumptions of how the world will develop. And each scenario will uh, represent um, a possible future. So what I do is I model for, the, for, each, um, uh, for, for each of the scenarios, generate the projections, layer them up, and then create a consensus projection. The implications of my study are profound for conservation strategies. So one of the significant outcomes can be guiding the decisions for assisted migration. Assisted migration is a conservation strategy that takes the seed and seedlings and relocate them to other areas that they are more likely to survive in the future. So by understanding which ecosystems are likely to be resilient in the future, we can make informed decisions on where to relocate the seeds. In summary, my research is a valuable tool for creating uh, the adaptation strategies and ensuring the survival of ecosystems that are critical to our planet. Thank you. So in 2017, UBC unveiled the tallest timber building of the world. However, in two years, in, like that record was broken two times since then. So, but you can see on the image on the top left that the tallest timber building of the world since 2019 hasn't changed height much. So we are kind of capping at 85 or around 90 meters. So why is that? Well, one of the problems is the connection technology. You know, in the past we used to connect smaller timber structures with nails. However, we came out with prolific mass timber elements like cross cemented timber, so we need larger connections. So we came out with steel rods that are literally larger nails. The problem with steel rods is that when they are subjected by loads, they basically break the wood. Basically, they plug through and they create what you call brittle failure modes that are, like really that are not very likable in design. So basically, in my research, as you can see on the left uh, bottom, Figure, I'm creating a hybrid timber connection. So basically, we are using the same type of rod we used to use now, and we add around it a thick layer of epoxy-based grout. So basically, the thick layer of grout is going to increase the footprint on wood and reduce stresses, increase the capacity, and eliminate the brittle failure mode. So pre pre preliminary studies have been done already, and we found that this type of connector can be as much as four times more resistant than the conventional connection. So now, what is the goal of my research? The goal is to craft design equation and a design procedure for this type of connections for engineers. So I started out by studying the material. So I did test on wood, on the grout, and on steel. And then I moved on to the connector level, as you can see on the image on the bottom left, where I tested the connector. I did about 1,000 specimens, and I applied load on the rods to find what is the capacity of each uh, connector, varying parameters like the diameter of the grout, diameter of the rod, and so on. So the next level is to do test on a group of connectors. So I'm going to test several connectors in a row with larger panels in order to see if there is any group effect. Now, I'm going to take all the experimental data that I have. I'm going to take all the insight and compile it and create the finite element model. And the goal of the finite element model would be to basically simulate different loading scenarios that I can ever imagine and create a bigger picture of what is the mechanical behavior of this connector. And then with that bigger picture, I can draft design equation and a design procedure for this type of connection. So basically on the image on the right, you can see the future. We can have walls that are very tall and that have only four connectors. Thank you. Floodgates are one of the most pervasive forms of aquatic fragmentation globally. Uh, the idea behind floodgates is basically to limit the size and the footprint of the floodplain so that we can live where the waters usually would be inundated. Um, the idea, the basic idea behind a floodgate is you take an entire floodplain stream and funnel it through a culvert and then put a big hat on it basically. 
And so that hat allows for water to move out of the system, but when the main stem of the river comes up and normally the floodplain would fill with water and fish, it pins the door closed and protects us from floods. Uh, as you can see on the map, the black dots are floodgate barriers and the red lines are lost floodplain habitat. And there are about 150 floodgate barriers on the lower Fraser River, blocking over 80% of the tr traditional floodplain habitat in that area. And that floodplain habitat is super important for juvenile salmon. Basically, juvenile salmon, when they emerge from their natal streams further upriver, they move down and, and, and move into these floodplain habitats to overwinter, usually from November to May, before they continue migration out into the ocean. Unfortunately, when they run into barrier after barrier, they get pushed further and further downstream and end up out migrating into the estuary months before they're supposed to be there. Months before they're supposed to be there, uh, undersized and very unlikely to survive to adulthood. Now, thankfully, uh, a lot of these floodgates are failing, as we've seen in the last two atmospheric rivers. So they're not keeping the water out any longer. Um, this gives us a really good opportunity to replace these with fish-friendly floodgates, which is what the design of our study is. So what we did was we basically built these pit antennas, designed and built these pit antennas on the downstream and upstream end of three different floodgates in the lower Fraser, uh, one of which was this top-mounted floodgate. Another is a self-regulated floodgate, so it basically is programmable and can be opened and closed at different times of the day, regardless of what's happening in the river. And the third site is a reference site where we chained the floodgate open and basically allowed fish and water to move freely through the system. And what we saw was pretty stark. So in the reference site, we saw 80% of fish that we tagged and released in the lower end make it into the floodplain habitat, showing that these fish really do want to go up into that area during that time of the year. That compares with the self-regulated site where we saw about 50% of fish get in there. So they're doing all right, but there's clear room for improvement with these self-regulated programmable floodgates. And this compares with the top-mounted floodgate represented in this image. Uh, where we saw less than 6% of fish successfully get into the floodplain habitat. So an order of magnitude difference in passage. Uh, this is the first study to basically document the, the extent of these barriers to juvenile fish movement and also provide rationale for improving floodgate passage with these self-regulated gates and also running studies to basically better match the movements of these floodgates with the movements of fish, and allowing fish into their traditional habitat. Thank you. Hello everyone, like climate change has significant change our lives and even now, like, um, even now we are still experiencing extreme weather um, recently. Last year, um, there was a heat wave in many countries around the world and then we are now facing a problem is how can we build a resilience community and cities and reduce the greenhouse gas emissions and at the same time build a sustainable buildings. And let's look at the number on the top left. 12% means in Canada, the emissions from building sector account for 12% of emissions of nation, national wide world emissions. And then by 2030, we have to reduce these emissions into zero. How can we make that? And then there's a question between different stakeholders in the cities, like urban planners, designer, engineer, act architect, and other um, civil citizens. We are questions that how can we do that? How can we make this map? And then we build this structure and framework, as you can see from the left. This is uh, we clad the pieces of puzzles together and free this. Uh, free, um, found this free work to test the sustainability of buildings. And the first um, layers is our uh, three aspects of buildings, including climates such as temperature, humidity, and uh, um, wind speed. And then the second aspect is the building envelope, so such as heating and cooling demands and lifespan of buildings. And the third aspect of building is the impact aspects, for example, greenhouse gas emissions. And later, we compare the availability of resources in the city and make a matching between the availability and the energy distribution. And finally, we found our structure, and, or maybe the result will help the stakeholder to form a more reliable, sustainable structure in the city. Um, so this study will start from Vancouver and then to Surrey and other countries around Canada. We hope this kind of work um, collect struck systematic for it work and help stakeholders to make decision and policy making. Thank you.
Okay. Mm. Does everybody here know that the forest, are, is, forest is quite important in the global climate cycle and can help people mitigate climate change? Well, if you don't know, here are some background knowledge. The tree will sequester carbon dioxide from atmosphere, transfer and slow in the biomass. Then the carbon will go to some ecosystem carbon pools like soil. After harvesting activities, the trees will be cut, sent to mills, manufacturing to different products, and then the biogenic carbon will store in this product through life cycles. And this product can also replace greenhouse gas intensive materials and traditional energy sources to reduce greenhouse gas emission. It's called substitution benefits. So here in BC, we have abundant forest resources here and a giant wood industry, which means that there is huge climate change mitigation potential embedded in the forest sector here. Meanwhile, the sustainable forest management can help to increase the mitigation capacity of the forest and even maximize it. However, the forest carbon is still missing in the current BC forest management planning systems. The chief forester said, well, there's lack of study focusing on the interrelationships between forest carbon management, water supply management, and climate change. So, that's the research gap we want to address in our study. We are trying to build a mathematical modeling framework to connect three models together for optimization process, which no one has done before because it's complex. And these three models, the first one is strategic forest match models, which is a core part of our modeling framework, can be used to simulate and optimize the water supply in BC forest. And the second one is called forest carbon budget models, which is used to account the carbon stock in different ecosystem carbon pools. And what's the third one? It's called world product carbon model, can be used to check the carbon fluxes in different water products through life cycles. We believe our modeling framework can help us to find the best long-term forest management plan to mitigate climate change here. And I also think like that the modeling framework can not only be used in BC, I believe it can be used in Canada or over the world, right? And we believe one day the Ministry of Forest Sector would like to use our models in their systems and add forest carbon to their planning systems. And forest companies can also use our methodologies and apply them to their forest carbon management projects. So I think it's time for a revolution for the current forestry in BC.